Okay, uh, please open the book of Habakkuk. Prophet Habakkuk. We're going we're gonna to stay most of the time in Habakkuk. Uh, we often quote scripture from Isaiah 55, where we say that, that says that the heavens, as heavens above the earth, so is, he said, God says, my ways are above your ways. We know this scripture very well. It's Isaiah 55, right? So the book of Habakkuk is a pretty good illustration to this uh, quote from Isaiah. Because we see that the prophet is struggling to understand the ways of God. By the way, his name could be translated as a wrestler, Habakkuk. Uh, he's really struggling to understand, and he's wrestling with this. But just because, and he's, it's difficult for him, and it's just as difficult for us, uh, but because the ways of God, sometimes, or maybe most of the time, difficult to understand, it doesn't mean that we should not try to understand. Because the, it's important to study the ways of God, because they will not only help us understand what happened with Israel in the past, but will help us to understand what's going on with Israel today and will help us to understand what will happen to Israel in the future. So when these things happen, we will not be confused or even shaken in faith. Habakkuk helps us to understand the ways and principles of God. They are true in all times, in all circumstances. So let's start reading Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, First four verses. Habakkuk 1, verse 1 through 4. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. That's what Habakkuk observes. He lives in Judah. He doesn't read the news. He lives there. And he lives in Judah, and uh, he observes Judah, the violent, he observes the violent society Judah had become. In spite of his ministry, in spite of his preaching, he doesn't see, he doesn't see there is no sign of improving. So courts, courts are led by uh, unjust elders who would pervert justice, who would listen to lies. He cries out to God, asking, Lord, for how long? How much longer? There is violence in the nation. And he said, you do not, he said, violence, and he said, you do not save from violence. He's puzzled why holy God would not punish injustice and violence and wickedness. How much longer he would permit this thing going on among his people? God, God doesn't seem to be doing much about what's going on. And we sometimes wonder the same thing by looking at what's going on around us here by watching like our children being brainwashed by this with this demonic wave or all these talks about changing gender for example we wonder lord maybe this is the time maybe it's time to do something note the prophet is not he's asking he's not questioning god he's he's asking because he feels confused by what he sees the book of Habakkuk is written in the form of dialogues. Habakkuk expressed his complaints, maybe even frustration before God, and now the Lord responds. His response in the verses 5 through 11, the same chapter 1, to the question, to the complaint Habakkuk had. And let's read a few verses here, starting from verse 5. Look among the nations that God is speaking back to the prophet. 
observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. So God is raising Chaldeans, which is the Babylonians. That fierce and impetuous people who march, who, who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs, they are dreaded and feared, their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen were galloping, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like eagles swooping down to devour. Verse 9, all of them come for violence. Their horde of faces move forward. They collect captive like sand, and so on. Well, God, remember, Habuga complained about wickedness and injustice and violence, and God is responding. He said, I am actually doing something about it. And guess what? When I, if I tell you that, you would not believe. Habakkuk learns. He learns from the God's response that God is going to raise Babylonians to punish Judah. And we have this description of this nation. And verse 6 is that God speaks of them as ruthless people. Verse 9, they all come for violence. He was just saying, Lord, is violence here? And he said, more violence is coming. And that's what I'm doing in response to your prayer. Being confused, now he's really confused. But after hearing God, he's really perplexed. And he speaks to God from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. We're going to read only verse 13. And it says here in verse 13, the same first chapter, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? He does not understand. The answer of God brought even more confusion to the prophet. He cannot understand how holy God can use even more wicked nation to punish the wickedness in his people. We might have the same question today when we think or pray about Israel. Habakkuk chosen, anointing the prophet of God, cannot understand it. He is really struggling with what God told him. It's okay to wrestle with God as long as you have the right attitude, as long as you humble. But if you are questioning God or doubt God, that's a different story. He complained about violence, injustice, and now he learns that even more violence is coming. Habakkuk was, known, was not the only man in the Bible who was struggling. Elijah was struggling. He even wanted to die. He even, even, uh, he even said to the Lord to take him to take his life because he couldn't bear this anymore. He brought the fire from heaven to prove that this is real God, hoping that people would repent and they did not. Why? Because God is not in the fire. After the fire comes a gentle whisper called Mamadaka. It's so gentle that it's very easy to miss. And that's what happened. They missed God. They noticed the fire. But God is not in the fire. He is not in the wind. He is not in the earthquake. He is something that behind, after that and after that, it's very gentle whisper. Everybody misses this, and they did. Even Elijah couldn't understand. Moses was struggling. He said, I can't bear these people anymore. But that's okay to wrestle with God, because these people were humble, and they were willing to learn. I should mention Jeremiah, who even cursed the day he was born, I think in chapter 20. They were humble and willing to learn. They were willing to change their thinking. Remember Jonah, Prophet Jonah? He was an interesting person. He was probably not as humble as Habakkuk. He, he wanted two people of Nineveh to be gone. And when they repented and God changed his mind, mind he was very upset and he also wanted to die. 
the Lord spoke to him, the Lord taught him, but I don't see him learning much, even by the end of his book. The Lord will teach us when we ask him, and he will speak to us. But it's very important to be open-minded when God speaks, because his answer, not maybe for sure, will shake your theology. And it will break your understanding. But if you are humble and willing to learn, you will learn. If you are not willing to learn, you will not learn, even if the Lord speaks to you himself. Let's go back to Habakkuk. He prepared himself to hear from God. And after hearing God in chapter 2, the answer to his second complaint takes the same, take the whole chapter 2. After uh, hearing God in chapter 2, his understanding became different. Let's read just a couple of verses from chapter 2. <clears throat> in chapter 2, it starts like this. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on the table, tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tears, wait for it. For it will certainly come, it will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. I'm going to stop here. That's where this famous statement comes from. It's quoted three times in the New Testament. In the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, and in Hebrews. The righteous shall live by his faith. So he learned. What did he learn from chapter 2? He learned this. Listen. God is going to punish wickedness by the wicked. Wickedness. To punish wickedness, God will use a wicked. God will not use a righteous to punish wickedness. God will allow wickedness to come and more violence to come to Israel because that's what in Israel, and that's what they chose. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 27. Listen to this. One who diligently seeks good seeks favor. But one who seeks evil, evil will come to him. Why would evil will come to him? Because he seeks it. He wants it. That because he chose it. What you choose, that's what's going to come to you. Proverbs 21.7 it says, the violence of the wicked will sweep them away because they refuse to act with justice. They don't want justice. They love injustice. That's why injustice is coming. They don't want peace. They love violence. Guess what? More violence is coming. They refuse justice. They will get injustice. They practice violence. They will get it. According to Strong's translation, do you know the word in the Bible for violence in Hebrew? Oh, you know it. Good for you. Hamas, violence, cruelty, wrong, false, injustice, unrighteous. It's all Hamas. It's all over in the Bible. In Arabic, it means different. It means zeal, but it's everywhere in the Bible. Pretty much in the New Testament, every Old Testament, I'm sorry, every time you see violence in the Old Testament, it's Hamas. In Genesis 6, 1, a couple of examples. In Genesis 6, 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Haaretz timale Hamas. 
Genesis 49, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31, do not envy the man of violence. Altikane ish Hamas. Altikane be ish Hamas. It's number 2555. In Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 23, it says, Prepare chains because the land is full of bloodshed. Talking about Ezekiel, talking about the land of Israel. Prepare chains because the land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of violence. Verse 24, I will bring the most wicked of the nations to take possession of their houses. Verse 24, I will put them, put it an end to the pride of, uh, of the mighty and their sanctuaries will be desecrated. Verse 25, when terror comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Ezekiel 7:25. The Lord often brings on us what we seek. If somebody seeks evil, he will get evil. Somebody likes violence, he will get more of it because he likes it. That's why our, our choice is important, what we choose. If we choose judgment over mercy, we will, get, we will be judged without mercy. If we choose unforgiveness, we will not be forgiven. Even being a people of God, if we choose injustice and violence, the Lord will bring it on us. He, will seek, he, he who seeks evil will get evil. We choose Hamas, we'll get Hamas. The book of Habakkuk doesn't offer in a, easy answers to the problem of evil in the world, but it encourages us to exercise living faith in living God, who will bring justice. He will punish both Judah and Babylon because both fail to maintain the God's standards of righteousness and justice. We should not be puzzled by the fact that God allows different things to happen to his people. It's a principle of God. And I'll show you a couple of good verses to prove it. Listen, whatever is in the nation, that's, going, that's what's going to come to the nation. I say it again. Whatever is in the nation, or whatever is in you, that's what you're going to get. That's what's going to come from outside. Why don't you uh, turn with me to John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, verse 44. Very interesting words Yeshua spoke about the devil. He said, you are the father of... Your father, uh, you are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, listen, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. What's very important, it's what in you. Let's look at devil just for a second. He used to be a perfect angel created with being perfect, you know that. He was created by God. He was created by the word of truth, through the truth, by the truth. It was nothing but truth and holiness around him, right? Because no sin yet. But he didn't stay there for a long time. Why he didn't stay in the truth? Look at the verse. I'm asking you, why he didn't stay there? Because, because there is no truth in him. Whatever is in you, that's what you're going to get. It's not as important where you are, in what environment you are, what's critically important, what's in you. Because if all truth around you, and holiness and righteousness, but if there is it's evil inside, this truth and righteousness will not enter you because it's evil inside. Another verse, John 14, verse 30. Whatever is in you will come and stick to you. Look at this verse. I will not speak much more with you, but listen. For the ruler of the world is coming 
and he has nothing in me. You see, the ruler, the devil is coming and he cannot get Yeshua. Why? Because he has nothing of his nature in him. The devil was in, in the middle of truth and holiness and this holiness did not enter him because there is no truth in him. It's evil in him. That's how you and I should live this life. We should not have anything worldly in us because he is walking around you like a roaring lion. What he is seeking for? What he is looking for? He is looking something of his nature in you. In you. And if he finds it, he will come and get you. But if he walks around you and he has nothing in you, he can do anything. Like he couldn't do anything with Yeshua. But if you have worldly stuff in you, if you have some worldly, evil stuff in you, he will have access to you. Because he finds something his in you. Devil, the angel, Lucifer, was born in heaven, was created by God. He was, was in there, but yet it was not in him. That's why he didn't stay in truth. Because, because there is corruption in the nation, in the nation, because violence is in the nation, wickedness, evil, all these things inside the country, justice of God, righteousness of God, truth of God cannot enter into this nation. Isaiah 59, 14. Isaiah 59, 14. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street, and uprighteousness cannot enter. The only thing, the only thing that can enter this nation from outside is what's inside of this nation. It's, it's, uh, it's injustice, more injustice is coming. It is violence in the nation, more violence will come and enter. Wickedness, more wickedness will come. Because righteousness of God cannot enter. Truth stumbles. Justice of God is turned back. Whatever is in you will come to you. If you're filled with godliness and truth, sin will not enter. Remember Yeshua was knocking on the door, trying to enter the church? He could not enter because everything was ungodly in this church. That's why God cannot enter. That is why, you, very important, before the Lord comes, we have to do what? We have to prepare the way. And that is why it always principle before the Lord comes who? John the Baptist. Always. Whatever they do to John the Baptist, the same thing they will do to the Lord. They, if they accept John the Baptist, they will accept the Lord. They kill John the Baptist, that's what they did to Jesus. If violence inside, they get ready for more violence. That's why the Lord, to the violent, wicked nation, brought the most wicked nation, Babylon, at the time. Today, it looks like the whole world is choosing violence and wickedness, including our nation. Guess what is coming to us? What we choose. More of it. Destruction will come, and judgment of God will come. There is no, there is no way around it. But there is always a way out of it, with God. With God. With God, you can always find precious in miserable. And this precious is your faith. That is why God is teaching him that righteous, the only way to go through this 
is to live by your faith only. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, let's read a couple of verses there. <clears throat> he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is shield, pay attention, he is shield to those who walk in integrity. God is my shield. Yes, if you walk in integrity. If you do not walk in integrity, probably not. Verse 8, God is guarding the path of justice. And he watches over the way of his godly ones. Scripture teaching us that the Lord protects the way of the righteous who live by, by his faith. But since his people refuse to walk in God's ways, there is no protection over them. And the wicked will come. God will allow wickedness to come and punish and judge those who are wicked. God said that the righteous shall live by his faith. His faith will save him in any circumstances. The righteous will remain faithful to the truth. He will walk in the ways of God, and that's why he will be under God's protection, under God's care. This is very important to understand and remember and not to forget. The Lord is shield to those who walk godly only. We can be people of God, but if we... If we it will not save us in the time of judgment if we choose ungodly ways. It will not save us. You can be named the, the man of God or people of God. The, the title never saves you. Never. What does save you is your walk that comes out of your faith. That's why righteous shall live by his faith. The judgment is coming because God is judging his people. He's judging the whole world. He's going to judge the world. It is coming on all the face of the earth. There is no place to hide, but there is a way to survive. It is to turn to God, put your trust in him, and walk godly. Then you shall live. Because the Lord is shield to those who fear him and trust him. That will save you. Your personal faith will save you. Nothing else and nobody else. As a result of this invasion of Babylon, God will set apart those who trust him from those who do not trust him. Like I said, this uh, famous statement that the righteous shall live by his faith quoted three times in New Testament, in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Those who walk ungodly those who walk ungodly will die from ungodly. It doesn't matter what title they have. And when the wicked, listen, and when the wicked will do what God wants, what God needs them to do, then the Lord will turn his wrath unto him and judge him. The day of trouble will come and it will impact everybody, but in a different way. Righteous will also be impacted, but not as ungodly. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, verse, uh, chapter 39, we'll read a couple of verses. Jeremiah 39, verse 17. I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. God is speaking to Jeremiah because when Babylon is coming, judgment is coming. But God said to, to Jeremiah, I will rescue you on that day. You will not be given into the hands of those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. You see? That's the only way to make it, to put your trust in God and walk in a godly ways. Now the concept of remnant of Israel maybe makes more sense to us because Bible says that Israel could be as many as sand, but... Only remnant shall be saved. In Isaiah 59, verse 20, it says, listen to this. <clears throat> a redeemer will come to Zion, and to those, and to those in Jacob, it says here, are in Jacob, who will turn from wrongdoing, declares the Lord. Listen, let's read it again. A redeemer will come to Zion, and he will come to those in Jacob. 
He will come to, to those people who are part of Jacob who turn from sin, from wrongdoing. He will not come to all Jacob. He will come only to those in Jacob who turn from wrongdoing, declares the Lord. Those in Jacob who turn from wrongdoing, this is Israel, and all Israel will be saved. Well, this food might be difficult for some people to swallow because this food needs to be chewed first. You know, when, what's the difference between eating yogurt and beef? What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> yogurt, you, do you chew yogurt? No, you, it just flows there. No effort. Beef, in order to chew, in order to swallow, you have to work. And the same thing with the Bible. Some things are just, they just go. And some things, some principles, the ways of God, we have to work on them. This is what happened before. That's what's going to happen today and the future with Israel. And not just with Israel. God wants his people to know him and believe in him. It's like a process of getting wine from the grapes. You squeeze the wine because the grape doesn't want to release the wine. And the Lord has many ways to squeeze the wine out of grape. He has many ways to squeeze faith out of his people because he has to squeeze the faith because righteous shall live, not because they are called Jewish or Christian or some not. Please understand, the title will not save you. Whatever you call, doesn't matter. It just does not matter how you call it. What does save you is your personal faith, living faith in God. We've heard about faith already this morning. Real faith. I mean, real stuff. That's why God wants to squeeze faith out of his people. Because they don't believe. But he wants to save them. And he cannot save you unless you believe. In Isaiah 65, verse 8, this is what the Lord says. As when justice is still found in a cluster of grapes. Uh, I'm sorry, juice. Well, juice is justice. <laughs> As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and people say, don't destroy it, there is still blessing in it. So I will do on behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. Who will not destroy those who have some juice. And this juice is those faith in God. That's how God separates his people from those who are not his. Those who trust him from those who trust the man. The whole chapter, second chapter of God, responds to uh, Habakkuk. And the, at the very end of the chapter, there is a final and probably the most important statement spoken by God. And it's the last verse in chapter 2, verse 2, verse 20. Uh, chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to this. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I think this statement could be at the very end of the whole Bible. Another important statement is righteous shall live by his faith is organically connected to this one. Faith. What faith? Faith in who? In him who is in his holy temple. The one who sits on the throne of the holy temple is sovereign God who is in control of everything what's going on here on earth. No matter how much it seems to us that everything is falling apart, God is still in his holy temple. And he is in control of everything, believe it or not. We see no justice. We see no truth. We see no righteousness. We see problems coming at us one after another. But that's only what we see. There are things we do not see. And the, and the real thing is that the things we do not see, they way more important than things, things we see. And the things we do not see that the God is in his temple. That's what Habakkuk's problem, and that's our problem. Habakkuk makes the same mistake that we all do. And that is, we 
he's paying too much attention to the visible things and not enough attention to invisible, or maybe not seeing invisible at all. Elijah did the same thing. We see troubles, we see powerful enemies, we see unbearable circumstances, we hear the diagnosis of the doctors, and we got scared, we got shaken, but we do not see the holy God sitting in his holy temple. That's where the problem is. Listen to what David said in, in Acts, quoting Acts 2.25. Acts 2.25, David said about him, I saw the Lord always, the key word, always, before me, because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. He will not be shaken. Why? Because he always sees the Lord. Always. Not on Saturdays, not on Shabbats only. Always he is before the Lord. He will not be shaken. It's quoting Psalm 16. It's not exactly what the Psalm says. The Psalm says this, I have said the Lord always before me. I have said the Lord. You have to do it. Well, I don't see the Lord. You have to set the Lord before yourself, and you have to do it always. Then you shall not be shaken. Then you shall not be afraid or scared. I have a question for you. What is the difference between believer and unbeliever? I will answer for you. <laughs> because now I'm supposed to speak, right? So. <laughs> The difference between believer and unbeliever. Well, say it's obvious. Unbeliever is the one who believes in God. Yeah, not very convincing though. There are, listen, there are unbelieving believers. Remember, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, something like that. There is unbelief in believer. There are two realities we have. Not one, not three, not four. Always, always two realities. And that's what you're dealing with. Visible and invisible. That's what determines who you are. You can, you can call yourself, no matter how you want to call yourself. There are two realities. And they are very real. By the way, one of them is more real than another. <laughs> and guess which one? <laughs> but for many of us, this... <laughs> this visible is more real. And that's what unbelieving believer is all about. I'll give you an example. Which of these two realities have more impact on you? Visible or invisible? The visible reality is your circumstances. What did doctors say? What the economy is going to be? All these problems, an enemy, Babylon, Hamas, whatever. It's one reality. It's serious, right? It's real. It's real. Invisible reality is holy God sitting in his holy temple. And we all better be quiet before him. Which one of these two realities have more impact on you? If visible, then you are unbelieving believer. If invisible, then you are true believer. And it's a huge difference. The true believer is the one who mostly impacted by invisible. Believer who is more influenced by visible is unbelieving. The true believer lives in invisible world. He is here just by faith, but he really lives in invisible. The true believer 
see invisible God in his holy temple who is controlling everything. That's why he's never shaking, he's not afraid, because he set the Lord always before himself. And that's how he lives. It's not only he feels it in the service during the worship. No, that's the way he lives his daily life. That's the true believer. His behavior, his thoughts, his thought process is all formed, it's all shaped, impacted by the invisible reality. His mind is on invisible. He sees God in his holy temple all the time. He sees trouble around him, yes, just like everybody else. But they do not have this impact on, on his thinking like, like regular people. He is not troubled by what he sees. He is not shaken by what he sees. Unbelieving believer, he goes by what he sees pretty much all the time. But if you ask him, do you believe in God? Oh, sure, of course I believe. But he is unbelieving. You understand? Yes, you do. Let's go, I'll give you an example. Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. I forgot to open this. Okay. <clears throat> 6 verse uh, 15. It's talking about Elisha. Remember prophet Elisha? Elisha. He had a, he had a servant. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, the army with horses and chariots was circling the city, and his servant said to him, Hopeless, alas, my master, what shall we do? <laughs> and one of the Bible says, It's hopeless. Elisha answered to him, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. That he may see what? Invisible. And behold, the mountains are full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Two realities, two believers. If you ask this servant, do you believe in God? Of course I do. My master is the greatest prophet of Israel. Well, I'm not asking about your master. I know he is okay. I'm asking you, do you believe in God? Yes, I do. Well, yeah, we see. He goes, yes, he's a believer, if you, can want, if you want to say. But he goes by what he sees. Only. He is shaken. He is hopeless. That's why we believers in the living God sometimes feel hopeless. Because we always go by what we see. Until we learn how to see invisible, we will be hopeless, shaken, uncertain, full of fear, and so on and so on and so on. It's going to be always like that. Until you learn to see invisible God. That's why Paul prays in Ephesians. Lord, open the eyes of their heart. So they can see. So they can see invisible. That's what true believer is. You understand? Yes, you do. Habakkuk saw only what is happening here. And that's why he was troubled. He said, Ay, uy vey. Well, uh, he was more impacted by what's around him. And that's the mistake we always do. But the real reality, the reality of realities. You know, we have a song of songs. Song of all songs. We have the Lord of all lords. We have reality of all realities. And this reality is the holy God sitting in his holy temple. The great I am in his holy temple. 
That's what matters. Everything else depends on this reality. That's why God said to Moses, you go and tell to my people, my name is I am. I am. In me, they have their being. It doesn't depend, doesn't depend on Pharaoh. It depends, their existence, their life depends on me. Because I am, I am. When you learn to see this invisible, then you will be a totally different person. And uh, Habakkuk, did you understand? Yes, he did. Because uh, the third chapter, the third chapter is full of praises. It's just, it just, it's a song. It's a song of praise. He's still kind of, uh, he knows it's coming. It's still scary. It's still important. But, but he's ready for this. He's not shaking anymore. He understands. He understands it needs to happen. But he is rejoicing not in the day of judgment. He is rejoicing in the Lord, who is God of his salvation. The righteous will experience trouble, but he knows that the Lord is his salvation. So what about you? What kind of believer are you? Uh, are you troubled, worried about this world? Now this world, we have a lot to worry about, right? So, how, yeah, I mean, we all, but the question is, how are you impacted by this? You see the news, you see there, you hear this, but the question, do you see something else? Do you pay attention to another reality? Do you? Yes. How much you are impacted by this? Are you in peace? Because he said, I leave you my peace. Do you keep it? God left you his peace. Do you keep his peace? Or maybe you lost it because of all these troubles around you. Confused? Maybe you don't see God in his holy temple. The Lord is not confused. He is not troubled. He is not concerned. And neither should you. How? You, as a righteous person, are supposed to live by faith in the one who sits in the holy temple. If you mostly live invisible, you will always be confused and scared and uncertain until you learn how to see invisible. The invisible, I'm almost done, the invisible reality determines, listen, the invisible determines the visible. The invisible is primary. Visible is secondary. The visible depends on invisible and not vice versa. The visible comes out of the invisible. The Lord spoke and visible came to being. So what kind of believer are you? Where are your thoughts? Where do you dwell? In invisible or in the invisible? So that's what I'm going to leave you with. So you can have something to think about over the weekends. Okay? <laughs> Examine yourself, examine the scripture, and don't be gentle to yourself. Be gentle to your neighbor, but not to yourself. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, that's the way we speak to you, Lord God. That's the only way to come to you. That's the only way to approach you, because you are holy and we are not. But in Yeshua, Lord God, you sanctify us. You sanctify us in your Son, Lord Jesus Yeshua. And we bless you and we praise you and we thank you that you are faithful to your principles. And your principles are the same throughout the centuries. And we are learning your principles. We are studying them. You're studying your word, Lord God. This is the only light in this dark world because this world is getting darker and darker and darker. And people are choosing darkness, they're choosing violence, they're choosing wickedness, abomination. They're choosing everything that is against you. And that's why that's what's coming to us. That's what's coming. The day of judgment is coming. Help us to be ready, Lord. Help us to be ready. Help us to examine our hearts. Help us to examine our commitment, our faith. Our faith must be manifesting in our daily walk. Daily walk. How we walk before you. Do we walk godly? 
Are we after godliness and righteousness and holiness? Then more righteousness will come, more holiness will come. Help us to examine our inner man, what's inside of us, because that's what's coming to us. Lord, our prayer for people of Israel, that they would turn to you, turn to you, not to United Nations, not to European Union, not to America, because it's not the way to survive. The way to survive is to put their trust in you. And I pray, Lord God, that they would learn their prophet. It's their prophet. It's a Jewish prophet, Habakkuk. That will understand what is coming. It's up to them what is coming to them. It's up to them what is coming to them. If you choose the godly ways, then you will come. If, you, if they choose violence and wickedness and corruption, that's what they're going to get. So we pray. Reveal it to them. It's a biblical truth. It's a biblical truth. It's not hidden from them. It's, it's in their Jewish prophets. Speak to them, Lord. And speak to all of us. And help us to be ready for things to come. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.